everybody. Welcome to the Flourish Podcast with Dr. Tony Ingram, where you will hear straight from some of the best practitioners and leaders in wellness on how to take control of your family's physical, spiritual, and mental health, because we are all designed to flourish. As a reminder, this show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the Flourish podcast should be taken as medical advice. For your own specific medical advice, please always consult with your own healthcare providers. Now, on today's episode, we have a very special guest to talk about breast screening and imaging. Sherry Pyron is a global clinical product marketing manager with 12 years of experience in medical ultrasound product development. She has over 30 years of multimodality medical imaging experience in outpatient imaging centers and as a radiology department head in hospitals. She is a breast cancer survivor for 17 years, a Six Sigma green belt, and she just happens to be my mom. So I am so excited for her to share some of her wisdom and knowledge with us today. Okay, I feel like this episode needs a second disclaimer for all of my really hardcore, crunchy people out there. My mom is in allopathic mainstream medicine, always has been. And obviously her perspectives and her experience are different from mine, which usually makes for better conversations. So we're going to talk about mammograms and ultrasound and MRI and even thermography. But yes, I will have guests on later episodes who are experts in thermography and more integrative naturopathic breast cancer treatments. We need all the information so that we feel confident taking our health into our own hands. So basically, don't come at me and enjoy the episode. All right, everybody. I've got my mom here today. Uh, My mom's name is Sherry, Sherry Pyron. And mom, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for, for having me. Uh, it's it's really a, a great time of year for us to have a conversation about breast care since we just finished Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, like many things in my life, I had this idea during October and just couldn't make it. You were listening to this probably not in October unless it's October of a different year. Um, <laughs> and that's Okay. <laughs> That is okay. Because I'm pretty sure that we have breasts all year round. I I think so. Last I checked anyway. Yeah. (laughs) I still have mine. Um, So let's, um, if you would, will you share with everybody your background in ultrasound and how you got started? Yeah, of course. So I, I was actually started out as a radiology technologist. Um, and in working in a small community hospital when ultrasound was still in early technology phase. It was used at that point in time, mostly for OB scanning. So my employer sent me to school to learn ultrasound so we could add this service to our community hospital. And in Hillsboro or Whitney? I'm sorry, what? Was this in Hillsboro or Whitney? So this was actually in Hillsboro. They, I did not realize that. So yeah. they wanted you to learn it in order to bring it to the hospital. Yeah, exactly. So they, they did not have an ultrasound service at that time uh, for the community and wanted to be able to offer that. So it oh, was, it really was cool. beginning to really, it, it wasn't a hundred percent mainstream because it was still pretty limited to mostly OB. There was some abdominal scanning at the time, but um, you know, it was, it was a growing modality. So over the years, ultrasound technology just kept advancing. We found more and more use cases every time there was an advancement that added more use cases. And even after I left the small community hospital, I continued to work in radiology departments. With my background, I was performing mammography, CT and ultrasound for for many, many years. 
And of course, as you already know, I am such a big geek. I, I wanted to be involved in all of those advanced imaging technologies that were coming along as soon as I heard about every one of them. So um, I decided to pursue a career with a medical manufacturer because they're in on things at the ground floor. So I spent about 10 years in the commercial side of, of ultrasound. And this is what led me to where I'm at today, which is in ultrasound product development. I work with engineers to give them the clinical perspective as they work on new products or new features. So now I'm definitely in on things from the beginning. I, I get to see and participate in the innovation as it's happening, you know, day in, day out discussions and whiteboards and all of that. I also travel globally now to work with doctors who are doing cutting edge medicine and research. So it, it's pretty crazy that I started this journey basically by saying yes to every opportunity that I was given. <laughs> you definitely did. You did. And I can confirm the geek situation. <laughs> That's right. I come by it honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, and, and you do work with, work for one of the largest corporations in the world, I assume, for sure in the United States, um, so much so that we were asked not to say the name of the company <laughs> during this interview today. So we don't want to get you in trouble um, and we will not get you in trouble. That's right. So we'll keep it all PC. Uh, now, with your background in ultrasound and all kinds of breast imaging from back when you were back in your clinical days, um, you had a bit of an event yourself as a patient. So, and this was, I believe this started when I was in dental school, if I remember right, mm -hmm. because you were 48 and, um, and do you mind sharing a little bit about your story as a patient? I, I'll be happy to. I, you know, I'm al already was passionate all along about, um, you know, different aspects of breast care. Uh, and this brought it home, you know, very personally. So um, a number of years ago, yes, when I was 48, I was doing a, a self exam, honestly, a self breast exam. And I noticed a change on one side, the, the skin actually appeared to be pulling in slightly. Um, and of course, i had been taught quite well how to do my breast self exams, so that I can teach other people. Um, but I had to be, you know, cognizant and use that for myself. So when I noticed that, um, I, I continued my self exam, I couldn't find a lump. And my annual mammogram, which had only been a few months prior was negative. So um, I was at work testing a new probe. So I took a quick look myself. And there it was a breast mass, it had increased blood flow going right into it. So I contacted a friend of mine who's a radiologist and then my doctor, of course, for an order so that they could get me in to do a breast ultrasound. And when they did the breast ultrasound, of course, then they proceeded right away to a biopsy. So at 48 years old, I had invasive ductal carcinoma. You know, the, the journey after a diagnosis of cancer gets really challenging. I, I wanted to find the right team, the right care. Um, I, I wanted to have the surgeon and the oncologist that I, that I knew would be the best for me. So I, I was talking to a friend of mine who also had breast cancer and she gave me some super valuable advice. She said, you want a doctor who specializes in breast care, all of the doctors. She said, find a breast surgeon, not a general surgeon. Find a breast oncologist, 
not a general oncologist. And, and this really made a huge difference because, you know, when you're, when you find those specialists that really understand what you're going through, they keep up with all the latest innovations and they know all of the latest treatments and they have the statistics and they understand all of that. And the breast is a really dynamic organ and people don't think of it that way because we think it just sits there, right? But it's a very dynamic organ. It, it changes from week to week because of our hormone influences. And of course, no two women are the same. Everyone has differences. So you want a team of doctors who understand those things completely. So um, after, my, after my surgery and things, the tests on the tu tumor determined that it was a, an aggressive tumor. Um, it was caught early, which is great. There were no, there was nothing spreading to the lymph nodes. Um, so the, the challenge was as aggressive as it was when they got me into surgery, it was actually twice the size of what we had seen on ultrasound or any other imaging. Um, so I ended up with chemo and radiation as my treatment course after a lumpectomy. Just because it had grown so much in such a short amount of time? It had grown in a short amount of time. We did look back at the mammogram from months prior. It was almost nothing there. It looked like nothing. That's why the mammogram was called as negative. Um, and so it had it had quite a, an aggressive tendency to it. What was the time frame from, because I, I honestly don't remember. I just remember it feeling like a really long time. Um, but that's me as a daughter who doesn't have any experience or knowledge with how long things take. Um, so I, in my mind, it was, oh, you're diagnosed with breast cancer. Are we going to do surgery next week? Um, and you're like, no, yes. no, <laughs> that's not how that works. Uh, right. So do you remember the amount of time that it was between diagnosis and when you actually had surgery? Um, it was probably two months between diagnosis and surgery. It, and and the nature with the nature of medical imaging and breast cancer, the reason that on the surgery it was double the size is because it really we weren't seeing all of it in imaging. And that's part of the nature of breast cancer. Um, that's one of the reasons why it can be so difficult because there are little tumor extensions that you can't see. They're just too small. There's no imaging technology that can pick up all of those little tiny extensions that can exist, especially when you have an aggressive tumor. Yeah. So those are some of the challenges with, with breast cancer in general. Well, and I don't know if this is similar in breast imaging, but when we're talking at talking about dental radiographs, um, mm -hmm. when we're looking at changes within tooth or bone, they we're taught that it takes a 40% loss of mineralization in the hard structure in order for it to be even visualized on a radiograph on an x-ray. So is that, is it something similar with soft tissue with breast tissue also? Um, well, so there's such a big difference between how, a how something using x-ray sees the breast tissue versus how, how an ultrasound sees it yeah. um, or even yeah. an MRI. Um, and so it's, it's, there are some technologies out there today that were not used often back when I had my my breast cancer that can help find those extensions of tumor um, in in the breast. Uh, and those can help a, a lot with really determining the size of that of that tumor prior to you going into surgery. Um, but at the time when I had mine, you know, there was, there really wasn't that, that assistance. Um, and even MRI was, was used somewhat limited at that time. I did not have an MRI that was, they did not feel that that was, um, that the technology at that time would have even helped us. Um, so 
it was, you know, the, those days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that we're moving forward. Well, that, so this is probably a good time then just to give sort of a, a broad overview of what are the different technologies that are used in breast imaging and used in screening um, and some of the kind of high level differences between them? Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's, let's, let's start with the, with the obvious, right? Let's, let's start with mammography. Um, mammography is considered the gold standard for screening, screening breasts, um, you know, the, and it's still, still going to be the first line that a doctor is going to recommend to, to image the breast. Even if you find a lump, um, most of the time that's going to be their, their first, first line uh, is to go to mammography. And then on the screening side, mammography is used mostly because it's quick, easy, inexpensive, and efficient. So the research for, for screening to reduce mortality is really well documented in using mammography. Uh, in studies, it's been determined that screening mammography can reduce mortality from breast, breast cancer by about 15%. And, and this is why the U.S. leads the world with breast cancer screening programs. You know, they started with mammography and it's just done very well. Well, I'm curious, though, because that's obviously it's not without risk. Right. Um, and is it because there is radiation involved? Is is it that mammos are happening so frequently that we're picking up more cancers or is it just that there are more cancers here that we're finding with mammography that we would have found with other methods of screening? So, you know, it's, it's, I'm not sure if there's, I haven't seen any studies so far and them they may be out there and I am just not aware of comparing, you know, screening, efficacy, so to speak, from one modality to the next. There are a few that have looked at two different types of, of screening methods, but not really looking at the whole, you know, the whole picture, right? So I think, though, that our reduction in mortality, honestly, is because we have had a, a very robust mammography screening program here in the U.S. for many years now. And women have gone more and more, right? They've accepted that more and more. Yeah. The good part on the risk side that you were talking about as far as dosage is as mammography itself as a technology has progressed, the dosage has come down more and more and more, which is really, really good. At this point, a standard screening dosage for mammography is about 0.4 millisieverts, millisieverts being the unit that measures, you know, radiation dosage. Um, and it, there are a few even 3D mammograms out there or breast tomosynthesis, you can call it either one of those names that can go maybe even a little bit lower than that, depending on the on the system. And so the the studies that are out there right now, as far as low, low dose radiation risk, according to the research that, that we've seen or that I, I've heard about, um, the risk is, does not increase until you reach dosages of about uh, 100 millisieverts or, or higher. So we're still, still well, well under anything that that would really cause a, a substantial raise in risk. Uh, and in an average year, each person just from, you know, sun, plane rides, whatever it might be, um, the average person each year receives about three millisieverts. So a mammogram is still 
quite substantially lower than than that and and would not really in significantly increase that number of of radiation dosages that you would get in a year. Right. And I and that's right in line with dentistry also is the more iterations of the equipment that we have they're able to get better images with less radiation each time. It gets to be a more efficient image. But it's still, it's obviously, it's not ideal. We don't want to increase the amount of radiation that we're exposed to. Right. Um, right. So that, no, that, that is good to know that they're at least keeping up and, and making those images more and more efficient each time. That's right. But that still makes us all really excited when there are screening methods that don't involve radiation at all. And right. That's kind of been your wheelhouse for a really long time. That's right. That's right. And, you know, and and all imaging has something, right, that that there, there is a principle within the imaging community that we use with with all of our imaging methods. And the, the principle is and you're familiar that with that. I know. With the I know. Alara. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, so we still use that and, and we use that even in ultrasound as well. Not Alara, what does Alara stand for? Because I'm uh, sure nobody else is nerdy and knows what that is. <laughs> it's as low as reasonably achievable. Yes. So yes. Alara just means you got to balance the risk benefit. You, you always have to balance that risk benefit you always use as low of energy, whatever imaging you're doing, you want to keep the energy as low as possible so that you're not going to use anything that's unnecessary. You know, in breast with ultrasound where I am involved, um, we don't have to worry about that for breast imaging. We worry about Alara for, for other types of ultrasound imaging, uh, like in obstetrics. So we keep that, we keep that principle for us as well. <laughs> so it's, it's not, not something that we, that we um, take lightly at all. So but with OB, with, when you're taking an ultrasound of a baby, right. there is some degree of minimal risk involved with the ultrasound when yeah when so whenever you put energy into the body mm -hmm. from a from some source there is some sort of reaction by the body right so you want to be sure that whatever that reaction might be does no harm that's that's the whole the whole thing. You want to be sure it does no harm. Um, there are there are studies out there, of course, that talk about how safe ultrasound is, even in the obstetric setting. But we balance that, bringing that energy in. Um, there is there's a process called cavitation that you know has has potential. Um, so we make sure that we keep our energy low enough that we don't cause any cavitation of, of tissues. What? Oh, that. I know Tell it sounds what... terrible, but it's, it's a big geeky word. <laughs> well, no, because we talk about cavitations in dentistry also, and it, it's, that's what my crunchy holistic people talk about. So I'm curious to hear what a cavitation is in regard to ultrasounding soft tissue. This is only in obstetrics or is this it's, in breast imaging too? It's not in breast imaging. It's only, it's not only in obstetrics, but it's not in breast imaging. We haven't worried. We don't see any cavitation happening in breast. Um, we do stay very aware if we're doing plural, you know, lung, mm -hmm. um, about we we make sure that we're not doing something that would cause cavitation and cavitation is just a collapsing of a of a, a cell right um so we do on the make cellular sure. level or could it potentially be something that is visible clinically no it's not visible clinically oh, it's, it's okay more on a cellular level okay is it does it kill those cells 
No. It just collapses them. Correct. That's really interesting. I mean, damage is damage, right? Yeah. So you don't you don't want to damage. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. oh, I learned something new. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's why we're here. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, keep going. Mm -hmm. So there are two types of breast ultrasound. One that's used as targeted imaging, meaning mm -hmm. you're going to go after imaging a certain location. Um, typically, it would be something that was identified either on a mammogram or an MRI or something that the patient feels. And then there's an ultrasound that's used for screening. So ultrasound, of course, without ionizing radiation, and you don't typically use any kind of injected contrast media. Um, it's perfectly safe. When, when you have like a mass or a suspicious area that's seen on MAMO or MRI, or if the patient feels a lump, then ultrasound can be used to see the tissue differently than the other imaging modalities. And that helps determine if it's something that should be biopsied or not. Um, we also have a technology that's called elastography. So elastography is looking at the stiffness of tissue. Breast cancer, well, and, and cancer in general, tends to be much stiffer than normal tissue, yeah. normal soft tissue. So when you look at something using the elastography, uh, and this is the technology that can kind of help see some of those um, little extensions of breast cancer that are difficult to see, then the elastography can show you that stiffness and show you that there's these little extensions that are stiff. The elastography, a type of ultrasound, or it's different altogether? So it's still, an, an, we're still using ultrasound to, to do the elastography. And what we're doing is elastography creates these little waves that we call shear wave. So, you know, if you drop a pebble in the water, you see these little ripples come out from the pebble, right? Mm -hmm. So those, those are what we would refer to as shear waves. So we send in a, a, a pulse to, to sort of be a, a quick little vibration into the, into the tissue. Mm -hmm. And it creates these little waves mm -hmm. out beside it. Do you normal see how tissue? much it bounces back. Right. So okay. normal tissue has, has this nice um, wavy property to it. It's, it lets the waves just go by, you know, there's no, no resistance to them. Right. Mm -hmm. And they go kind of at a slow speed. If the tissue is stiff and, and you look at the waves that come out, those waves are actually very fast. And so when, when something is really stiff and you get this reaction of these waves that are really quickly going out, then we, we're able to measure that. And that measurement is the, 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 what they use, what we use to say, okay, this is much stiffer than normal tissue. So this is a problem. This tissue is very stiff. And there's certain, you know, levels that we look at to say, okay, it's really, really stiff. So this must, this must be more suspicious. This one is slightly stiff. You know, it's maybe just so, so we'll watch it, that kind of thing. Okay. So would elastography be used in screening or is it primarily after something has been found on another test? Yeah. So elastography is used when you identify something, not necessarily on another test, but in, in the ultrasound itself, when you have a, a focal lesion that you can, that you can place the elastography on, it doesn't go across the entire breast. 
when you're doing elastography, it's a, it's a very limited location. Um, shear waves are, are very tiny, tiny, tiny waves. Uh, even though they're really fast, they're very tiny. So measuring those, you, you have sort of, sort of a limited space to be able to measure them because they are so tiny. So is this, this makes it sound like it's not separate from the ultrasound appointment. No, it would, like, it would be like people are of, using this in, it's all in the same machine. The same machine can yeah. do elastography. That's also just doing normal ultrasound type of images. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Be the okay. same machine. Now the, the screening ultrasound, that's like, that's typically a different machine because for screening ultrasound, you want to be able to see the entire breast because we have, you have no idea, you know, you, you need to see everything. Yeah. So there's a screening ultrasound machine that's called ABUS or automated breast ultrasound. Um, and this is used mostly for screening women with dense breasts because when you when you use it in in conjunction with mammography then you really get a whole picture that can make you really confident you're seeing everything and there's you know not something small in there that's going to sneak by you so wow. it, the the thing about mammography when you have dense breasts the the glandular tissue and the the bad tissue like breast cancer all look white. So dense breasts can hide things on mammography. Now there are still some things that they can see that they do still screen dense breasted women with mammo because there's microcalcifications that can be a, an indication of a, a breast early breast cancer. So they do still use that. But the ultrasound can be used then to see because ultrasound sees the the breast mass or a breast cancer would be very light gray or white, but dense tissue is and glandular tissue is all different shades of gray. Mm -hmm. Even fatty tissue is another kind of shade of gray. So they all have these different shades of gray. And then you have these, you know, highly dense breast masses that are much easier to see on ultrasound just because they are closer to that white on the ultrasound. So you're, you've got better contrast, so to speak. So standard of care screening is mammo first, regardless of breast tissue density. That's right. What about, so I know what the standard of care is. What is Sherry Pyron's opinion? What should you do, do you think, for screening dense breast tissue? So I I still feel that mammography is is going to going to show you things that are very early by those little calcifications. So I still like that that use of mammography as the beginning and then ultrasound as an adjunct to mammography. Um, I think women with dense breasts should have both technologies available to them, should have both as their screening technologies so that you have a, a clear picture of everything, you know, yeah. on on a regular basis. So I think it's important to understand that, you know, there's, there's unfortunately not one imaging method that will do it all. Um, it's, it's just not, not what we have at this moment. The, the technology is not a hundred percent there. Um, you know, breast ultrasound, even with the ABUS, the screening breast ultrasound, it's really good. Um, we can see some calcifications, but sometimes we can't see the, the little clusters that happen in if you have breast cancer that's still in situ. So if you can find breast cancer in situ and get rid of that, 
man, you, you know, you've saved so much time, money, treatment that is unpleasant. You know, you've, you've, you've really got a lot there. If you yeah. can take care of that while it's still in situ. And, and that, that, sense. that, that's where mammography is, is strong. Gotcha. Um, and then for those that, but those masses that are, you know, either fast growing or they're just hiding behind dense tissue, then the ultrasound is really strong there. And that that Avis ultrasound can really give you a, a great look. Um, you know, and and I, I want to I, I know people probably don't like statistics, but I, I really want people to understand. So. In the world, not just the U.S., in the world, we have about 40 percent of women who have dense breasts, dense breasts defined by mammography and documented. That's a lot. It is a huge percentage. And beyond that, 71% of all breast cancers occur in dense breast tissue. Why is that? Wow. <laughs> Right. Why is so, that? Do we know? I don't think we actually know why. I think we're doing better now at exam at, at the research, at getting studies done, at looking through things, at you know all of the things. Right. Yeah. Um. I mean, even you know when I first started doing mammograms we knew that imaging women with dense breasts was a big challenge, but then we didn't really have a great answer for it. We just knew it was a big challenge, you know? So, so I, I, I would like to make sure that women understand all of this as completely as possible. You know, we, we love our education, right? <laughs> education is what we're about. We want to be sure. And for women to to really take care of themselves, they need to be they need to be their own best advocate and they need to understand and and you know be educated, right? That sounds very oh. holistic of you, mom. Be careful. <laughs> oh, it's very, very, very <laughs> very much a part of who I am. So, um, but you know, this, this year, just earlier this year, the FDA um, issued a national requirement that mammography centers must inform patients about their breast density that's seen on mammograms. So this will, this all of this will start, the, the providers will have to comply by September of next year. Um, now, there were a number of states that already had a, a law like this on their books, Texas being one of them. Um, but that was, that, that's a big deal now, that the FDA is actually wanting all of, all of the mammography providers to be sure that they notify women of their breast density after they have their mammogram. Now, the next step, of course, is then, you know, what do you do, right? So so there's a lot of providers that are kind of trying to figure out, okay, so we inform them of this, but then what's our next step? You know what that says to me, though, which uh, this is just the, the jaded part of my brain. That says to me that for decades, mammography centers that have become profitable doing one thing and that's mammograms have just done their mammograms really quickly and not told the patients, the women who are coming in that that might not be the only good screening tool for them. And so thousands, maybe millions of women are leaving mammography centers every year thinking that they did they did what they're supposed to do they got their yearly mammogram or or biannual mammogram and that's all they need 
And for decades, that's been happening. That's so right. much so that the FDA had to slap their hands and say, no, you need to tell them. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's that's correct. Like I said, we we are lucky here um, in Texas. And and there are there were several other states as well that that have had laws already on the books that you must notify your patients of their breast density. Um, and, and that's the, the other good part is that, you know, for those, those states like Texas, where this has already been on the books, the providers also already have in place what they offer next, what their next guidance is, you know, okay, you have breast density, you know, you, your, your breasts are at, at a level B or C or whatever, we suggest that you have this next modality done. Um, and there are there are several states, um, also Texas, that have reimbursement available as well for for a second um, modality for dense breast. I have reimbursement. So you're saying that some of them that many of them don't have reimbursement, not for the second modality. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, that's right. So, so let's keep following the money. Is it, are mammography centers always separate from ultrasound centers? No. Okay. You would think that that would be easy. So add add an ultrasound machine, add a sonographer or two and be able to have that in the same facility. Yeah. Typically, I mean, of course I don't I I'm I'm in the ultrasound world nowadays, so everywhere that I go has ultrasound. Um, but most of the mammography centers that that I'm aware of have typically will have an ultrasound service. Uh, some of them will have the ABUS service as far as screening ultrasound. Uh, Some of them will have the screening MRI for breast as well. Um, So it depends on on the facility and, and, you know, depends a lot on on the the management or the leadership of that facility. Company behind the the screening facility. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Just out of curiosity, what is the price range or just the price difference between a mammo machine and an ultrasound, whether it's ABUS or just normal breast ultrasound? Um, yeah, I am not real sure about what the cost of the mammo machines are nowadays. Um, I, my, my assumption is that the cost is going to be very similar between the two machines. Yeah. Um, I've heard you mention MRI a few times and, mm-hmm. and that's something I know very, very little about. Are are they able to use MRIs as a screening tool for breasts? And is that more and more common? And when would you do that? Yeah. So MRI is actually able to be used for screening for breast screening and and for dense breast screening. Um, That is actually when FDA came out with the new guidance about notification, um, their their suggestion or their recommendation on the on the guidance was to go to uh, breast MRI as the second modality for for dense breasts. Um, So, you know, when you when you are told by your doctor, oh, by the way, you know you have dense breasts. You need another screening method. Um, most likely, they will go. They will suggest MRI because of that recommendation from the FDA. There's the the MRIs that do breast have a, a special um, referred to as a coil, a special uh, method for the magnetics. Um, to put on the system to scan breasts. You actually lay on the table face down with your breasts in a a, like a holder that kind of drops them away from your chest wall. So um, 
just a little bit about the technology behind MRI. The MRI uses magnetics to stimulate protons in your body to align with the magnetic field. So it's not ionizing radiation. The MRI does use, or they, they do uh, prefer to use an injection, an agent called gadolinium to highlight the blood vessels in the image. Um, this gives them that, that resolution that can high, then can kind of um, bring out highlight, so to speak, any areas where the blood flow is hyperactive. So breast tumors tend to have very hyperactive blood flow going into them. Um, and so that's, that's why they use this. Uh, otherwise, the MRI is not as efficient at finding breast cancers um, without the gadolinium. That's, that's why they suggest it. Now, in the medical community, they do feel that gadolinium is safe. Um, it is a rare earth metal. So there is that. Um, so there's a lot of people who would prefer not to have that injection because of that. Um, when they do use gadolinium, it, it goes through your body and is excreted by your kidneys. So it is not something that they would inject for someone who had uh, any kind of renal uh, impairment. But um, it's, it is a small amount. It doesn't have to be a, a large injection. It's a smaller injection, but um, you know, that's, that's how they use the MRI. So potentially some heavy metal issues. Yeah. Uh, especially if your kidney's not able to process efficiently. That's right. Uh, All right, right, guys, that does it for part one with my mom. We will absolutely bring her back for a part two. So stay tuned until the next episode and we'll see you then. Bye for now. Bye.